All right, so before we proceed any further for any step-by-step -step hands on and understanding of cloud, it's the time we need to understand some core concepts of cloud computing. And the first question which is coming in mind is what is a cloud? Normally, most people do not know what is the difference between a cloud and a normal server. And there are many definitions also available when you search online. For me, the most relevant definition of cloud is something which is here. It's an approach to computing that's about having the right resources at the right time and connecting to a variety of devices and endpoint. Now, when I'm talking about resources here, it can be your application, your database, maybe your machine which is hosted on the cloud. And when you want to access that thing, you can access this thing in a variety of devices and through variety of endpoints and protocol configurations. That's what a cloud is all about. But this definition is not enough to understand cloud. Because if you want to actually understand cloud, you need to understand what is cloud computing. And to understand that, I have a very basic human story which can maybe connect with the cloud. Like as you can see here, we are trying to understand cloud computing. And to understand this thing, my story is having a scenario. The left side part, you assume that that's your home. And the right side one is your office. And like a normal working professional, you every day go to your office and you come back to your home. Now when you're going to your office and when you're coming back to your home, I am giving you two options. Let's say you have your own car using which you can go to office and come back. And the other option is you may be going to use some public transport. This may be an office cab, this may be a bus, or maybe you're using a local metro. Now the question is, which one you prefer? Do you prefer to go by your own vehicle like a car, or you prefer to go by the public transport like a bus and metro? Now if I ask you this question, I know that majority people are going to choose car. And somehow the reason behind that is convenience. But before you come to any conclusion, I want you to compare these two things with these four factors. The first factor is cost. Now if you check, if I have my own vehicle, I need to have a huge investment on that vehicle. Also I need a huge investment to maintain that vehicle and to make it running every time. Also if you're driving your own car, you need to know driving, you have some extra expenses like driving license and other things. While in the other case, the cost which is involved with the public transport is very 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 less compared to your own personalized vehicle. Same way, in this too, if I focus on flexibility or I can say a convenience, then my personal vehicle will be more convenient for me compared to public transport. So cost wise, public transport is winning and convenience wise, our own vehicle is winning. Now what if we focus about the risk and on time availability? in which case we are going to have higher risk. Now we have to focus on both the risk. Like for example, maybe you're driving a car and on the road somewhere it got punctured. Now if this is your own car, who's going to take care of that thing? The answer is you. But suppose if your bus is getting punctured, you just could take another bus. You don't need to take care of that because that's not your own vehicle and you are not having that kind of risk. Now. I do not want to compare this thing further with this car and bus kind of thing because in this case we will not come to any conclusion. But to understand this thing properly, let's just assume that your car is actually your own data center where you are storing your data which is your organizational data center. And let's say the bus is that public transport which is available to you on the pay as you go unit. It's something like this, you have to pay only that amount of money which you are using right now. So if you're traveling from one destination to another destination, then you just have to pay for that. Now the story is somehow giving me that advantage that if I focus on cost, flexibility, risk and on time availability, somehow in all four, cloud is winning compared to on-premise server. Because cost wise, you have to pay only what you're using. It is totally flexible and it is allowing you to scale as you want. It is totally taken care by the vendor who is actually providing their cloud computing. It means if you are using Azure, Microsoft is responsible for the Azure cloud computing resources. And if same way you are using GCP or AWS, Google and Amazon is going to take care of that thing. You don't need to worry about that as a customer. And all the cloud computing environments are providing you on time availability of your resources. In short, somehow we have something called 99.99999 and there are multiple nines which are available in the high availability. 
and that's why your resources will be always available to you. Technically, you'll not have a downtime. These are those factors which are actually making cloud computing different than normal servers. And that's where we need to understand that what is a cloud and how it is different than a normal server. Now continuing this story, there are a couple of key concepts which we need to understand to understand the cloud properly. As I mentioned right now, the high availability is talking about the on time availability. We have a scalability and elasticity which is focusing somewhere on the risk factor as well as the flexibility which you are getting because of cloud. Same way we have a global reach. Depends upon the cloud provider which you are using, you will have a global regions available across the globe. And you can decide where you want to host your resources. Security and disaster recovery is also taken care by the cloud provider. And you do not need to maintain a high infrastructure, expensive infrastructure with resourceful manpower 24 by 7 to continuously take care of that. All this cost will be reduced and the pain is also going to be reduced with that. When we talk about cloud, there are three different cloud models which are available in all the clouds. Public cloud, private cloud and hybrid cloud. Now if you talk about Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud which is GCP and AWS which is from Amazon, all three are coming in the public cloud. When you are using public cloud, you do not need to have any capital expenditure to scale up. Automatically all these clouds are providing you scaling facility and whenever you want you can scale up or scale down. Your application databases can be quickly provisioned into that within few seconds and minutes and you can use that thing as long as you want. Most of the public clouds are going to charge you on many twice and you have to pay only for whatever usage you are doing. If you are focusing on the private cloud this is more like extending your existing data centers. Let's say you do not have one data center but you have 8 to 10 different data centers available in the different part of the world. In short, you have your own private cloud. And when you are taking care of this private cloud, your organization is actually having full control over that. It's like your own vehicle. It's like your own personal car which is totally taken care by you but you also responsible for resources and security and everything which is happening in that. While the other option which is available and nowadays very popular is a hybrid cloud. Most of the time hybrid cloud is combination of public and private. There are organizations even though public cloud is having so many advantages they are not ready to move everything on public cloud for security reasons. And that is the point we are going to take care of that thing in a hybrid environment where we are going to make our cloud enough flexible that we can connect our public and private both the clouds into one. The organizations are going to decide which kind of things they want to put on public cloud and which kind of things they want to keep it with them. Also they take care of the full compliance, security and the legal requirements for their clients and for their products. To understand public cloud scenario, you have to understand these three words which I mentioned. When we talk about Microsoft Azure, Azure provide everything as a service. And that's why when you talk about infrastructure, platform and software, they have three different flavors to use cloud. It's something like they are giving you a package or a combo deal kind of thing. Obviously software as a service is that particular portion which is the most cheapest one as well as the one which is having minimum control in your hand. Same way when you move to platform as a service it's going to give you a full control on two layers which is application and data. When you deal with any platform as a service maybe it's an application or maybe your SQL database which is running on Azure all this are counted like a platform as a service and that will be giving you full control on two layers which is application and data and the other layers of this architecture like your operating system, your virtualization, your servers and your runtime, everything will be taken care by vendor. Vendor means we are talking about Microsoft in respect to Azure. Suppose if you are using AWS cloud, we still have same kind of flavors in that also. But in that case, that will be taken care by Amazon. Same way we have the third and the most expensive part which is infrastructure as a service. And this part is the one which is giving you maximum control because it's giving you a full control on five layers. Starting from application to operating system, you can control everything including the middleware and the runtime which is running in that. 
Still, you can customize virtualizations and servers and all those things, but it is still controlled by the vendor who's providing this cloud. Basically, when cloud was invented, all the cloud providers have offered three different kind of services to the customers. And these are the three services, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. In recent times, we have one more flavor added into this, which is known as serverless computing. Now we will cover serverless computing later on in the same course, but right now, I want you to understand these three sections, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And throughout this course, whenever I'm going to create anything, I am going to make sure that you understand this thing, that this part belongs to which bucket. Let's say if I'm creating virtual machine that will belongs to infrastructure as a service. And let's say if I'm creating one app service on Azure, it will belong to platform as a service. And same way, suppose if I'm going to use Office 365 and I'm going to associate that, or maybe I'm going to use Google Drive and I'm going to associate with my Logic app, that will be counted as a software as a service. So we have all these flavors associated in this, and we'll understand this thing in depth when we do step-by-step -step hands on. Now it's the time to move on with Microsoft and cloud computing. Microsoft has taken cloud computing in a very serious way. And they are having a team of IT professionals and developers working on Azure Cloud day in, day out. When we focus on cloud computing, Microsoft is the only cloud provider which is providing you more than 58 regions available across the globe. As you can see on this particular world map, each dot is representing one particular region. And remember, one region can have minimum one data center or it can have three data centers. So when we are talking about Microsoft Cloud, it's having this kind of geographical presence. We will focus more on Azure regions and different kind of resources which are available on these regions when we talk about concepts like high availability and geo replications. I hope you are clear with all these Azure concepts. Let's move on with some practical hands on now. All right, so it's the time to understand Azure Resource Manager. Now, we already know terms like resources and resource groups. We know that in our portal, we have seen that resource groups, which are going to have multiple resources inside that. And these resources can be of different types, and it can also belong to different locations. Now, let me tell you one thing, that this resources and resource group terms are actually launched with something called Azure Resource Manager model. This model came up with this new portal which we are using nowadays. But most people don't know that before few years, there was an older portal. This legacy portal was not having an ERM model. It was following something called Azure Service Manager model, ASM. Now if I basically compare this ASM and ARM models, then Azure Service Manager was actually followed by the legacy portal in which there was nothing like resource group. At that time, things were organized based on the type of that thing. Like all the virtual machines will be grouped into one particular category. All the web apps will be grouped into another one. While same way, all the databases and storage is going to have some different categorization. Now in modern ARM model, they have followed this thing as a logical grouping. And that's the reason our resource group is a logical grouping, which is not bounded to any particular location or a type of the thing. When we create Azure Resource Manager based resource groups, our resource groups are going to be either a project name or a client name kind of thing, which allows me to group them into one. Like when you see this resource group, the name of the resource group can be anything. It can be my project name, and then I can have multiple things which are used by that project. It is also going to help me in moving this multiple things into another resource group. So later on, if I want to move all the things to another resource group, or if I want to move to another subscription, these resource groups are going to help me in managing those things with ease. Not only that, if I want to delete a resource group, it is automatically going to delete all the resources which are there inside that. So it saves my lot of time that I don't need to go to each and every individual resource and I need to delete this. I can delete a resource group which will delete multiple things and also it's going to take care of the dependencies. It means if you have resources which are dependent on other things, like I have a SQL server 
and it has a database inside that. So it's an obvious reason that I have to delete a database first and then I can delete the full server. But when I delete a resource group, I don't need to worry about the dependencies of my resources. My delete resource group option is going to take care of all the dependencies. Also, when we go to access control, we know that this is associated with the authentication and authorization. It means your resource group model also associate with the security. If you want to give access to a particular user up to a certain resource group only, then that's also a possible that you can give uh, access rights to a particular group or a user that he cannot access anything outside this boundary. These resource groups are having all these advantages which really help us in managing multiple resources in a particular subscription. Azure Portal is one of the most useful thing which you can learn in Azure. Uh, this is ultimately a website. You can see that the URL is portal.azure.com and if you have successfully activated your free subscription then this is a portal which is going to help you to create a different different Azure resources in this. As you can see in the left side column we have a create a resource button and if I click on this we have flavors of resources available in this. If you want to create a virtual machine or maybe you want to create a containerized applications with the Kubernetes or maybe container registry or maybe you want to host a simple database which is a SQL database or maybe a MySQL or PostgreSQL. Azure resources are available on Azure portal and not only Azure resources there are a couple of services which are associated with Azure portal which are super flexible and it is really easy to customize Azure services and resources within this portal. If you want to deploy anything on Azure, the first place is Azure portal. While other than Azure portal, there are people who can use PowerShell or they can use even this one which is known as Cloud Shell. We'll see Cloud Shell in some time but right now I want you to understand different sections of this Azure portal. Like you can see when I close this thing, this screen which is visible here is known as dashboard. If you want you can add multiple dashboards here and in different dashboards you can have different different sections available in that. When you choose your dashboard, it's going to switch that thing and it's going to show you whichever section you have added into that. Then we have something which is known as home. This home is providing you all the recent resources which you have checked. And then it's giving you different different sections where you can get deal with the, your subscription, you can deal with the templates available on this or you can see the services which are available from older portal. Yeah, this is also something which I want to add that there was a classic portal before this. So when Azure was invented, this portal was not there. This portal uh, launched by Microsoft in the year 2014. And then from that point onwards, they have shifted everything to this new portal. In this new portal, everything which you are able to see, which is having a word classic, this simply means that this is available in this new portal, but this is this belongs to the older model, which was known as a service model. The important part of this portal is resource groups and resources. And you can access any of your resources, which is inside a resource group. So you can see I have a four resource group inside this resource group section and if I want to see my all the resources it's going to show me all the resources. Also it's showing me the details of that like uh, this belongs to which resource group, which type of the resource it is and also it belongs to which region. Azure portal website is really really improved in last couple of years and Microsoft is still working on this and they are actually working on this and making this thing better and better every day. Now. We all know that Azure portal is allowing me to create a resources and different kind of resource groups easily. So we have varieties of things offered by Azure in this and if you want to create any of those things using this portal, we can just follow simple steps and we can create it. Ultimately, this Azure portal is nothing but a website and one of the important feature of this website is this button. You can see when I move my mouse on this top H is showing me that we have something called Cloud Shell. If I click on this, it's going to open the bottom bar in which it's going to show me that I can connect 
with something called cloud shell which is allowing me to connect with this cloud shell and I can fire a scripting using PowerShell or Bash. Because I am creating this thing in my account first time, it's showing me that you do not have any storage mounted for this. Now don't forget we have something called Azure Storage which is allowing me to store a couple of files into my Azure account. It's asking me that you please create a new storage. So I'm going to click on Show Advanced Settings. And then I can choose my region and the names of my resource group and storage account. I'm going to click on a create a new account and I'm giving my new shell 345. That's the name of the resource group. Name of this I'm giving my shell 345 and the file share inside that I'm giving my file share 345. I'm using this number into this just to keep the uniqueness into this because there are chances that sometimes when you create a new account and a new resources into this account, you will have issues and you'll have conflict because somebody has already created things with the same kind of names. So I always advise you put your name or some unique number with that to remove this conflict. If I click on create storage, there are chances that it's going to deploy one new storage in this resource group. And then if I go to my resource group section of this account, I am going to have a new resource group with this storage account created inside that. Remember, this storage account is going to be associated with my cloud shell. And then this is that process which I have to do only once. You can see it's created and now it's initializing my account for cloud shell. After a few moments, this process will be done and I'm going to get my command prompt kind of terminal. Yes, now my terminal is ready and you can see it's showing me PS for PowerShell and it's showing me that we are able to fire some commands into this directory. Focus on certain things like on the left top corner, we have a drop down from where we can switch from PowerShell and Bash. PowerShell is one of the widely used scripting language from last couple of years. And same way, even Bash is also equally popular. There are a number of administrators who advise and who prefer Bash on top of PowerShell. Same way, there are a couple of there who actually love PowerShell. When we are dealing with Bash or PowerShell in this cloud shell, remember, literally you can do everything which is possible with this Azure portal through these commands. Actually, there are a couple of things which you can do with PowerShell, but you cannot do this thing directly in this portal because ultimately this portal is nothing but a website which has some limited features available in the UI. But if you're dealing with Azure Cloud, almost everything you can do with PowerShell and the commands of PowerShell. The better way to deal with this Cloud Shell is you first click on this button, do this process which I have done just now. Once this process is configured and your cloud shell is connected with the storage, it is advisable you close this and then you open a new tab in which you're going to type shell.azure.com. We know that the URL of my portal is portal.azure.com. If your cloud shell is connected, you just type shell.azure.com. It will ask you which directory you want to use. Let's say I'm using my default directory in which I have configured my cloud shell. And this is going to give you a better UI where your cloud shell is available in a full screen. Now onwards, whenever I want to use cloud shell, I always type shell.azure.com and then I'm going to fire my commands into this. We can also save a scripting in the .ps1 format and then we can run it here. Remember this cloud shell is running inside the Azure portal and that's the reason it is directly connected to that. So we are not going to use a local PowerShell or a command line interface which is installed in the machine. We are directly going to use this cloud shell which is doing almost the same thing. We already know Azure subscription. But now it's the time to deep dive into this. As a definition, Azure subscription is actually a logical unit of Azure services that is linked to an Azure account. And obviously we know this thing because 
as I said earlier, before starting this particular course, I am sure you have your own Azure subscription. If that is organizational subscription or if that is free, that's also fine. It's ultimately a subscription which is allowing you to associate all this logical unit. It also helps you in security by controlling which kind of resources you want to give access to which user and to whom you want to restrict. And it also helps you to configure and understand your billing boundaries. Like you can see here, I'm inside my subscription and left side in this particular column, I have clicked on subscriptions. You can easily find out same thing in all services also. When I go inside subscriptions, in my account, if I have multiple subscriptions, it's going to show me list of those. I have one subscription right now. The unique subscription ID for this particular account is visible here. My role for this is an account admin and the cost which I have consumed so far is this much. If I go inside this, this each subscription is going to associate with the billing period and we can either cancel the subscription or we can manage it through this. It is also giving you a detailed analysis of your cost which you have consumed for a particular resource and the spending limit which you have associated with that. There are a couple of things which we can handle into this like cost analysis and budget maintenance and all this thing which will help you when you want to understand this thing and you want to control the cost of your particular account and you want to control the cost of your resource utilization. Now coming back to this. We already know that we have something called Azure AD and there is one confusing question which I want to ask right now. We already know that we have a hierarchy like resource group is going to have multiple resources inside that and now multiple resource groups will be inside Azure subscription. But now the question is Azure subscription is that particular piece which is also including accounts like identities in Azure Active Directory or in a directory that is trusted by Azure AD like your organizational or a work or school organizational account. Now when you have any existing work or school account or I can say your organizational AD and when you associate that with Azure AD that part is also coming under the umbrella of Azure subscription. And that's the reason this is a bit tricky because Azure subscription can have association with multiple AD and that's the reason one Azure subscription can have multiple Azure Active Directories inside that. To understand this thing, if I go back to my portal, you can see that on the right top corner, it is showing me my user account which is associated with my email ID and there is an option switch directory. If I click on this, it's showing me that you have a new blade which is allowing you to choose your directory and subscriptions. Inside this subscription, I have three different ADs which are associated with this. Out of this three, this is the default directory which is there. I can choose whichever directory I want to work with and as we already know, in each directory, we are going to have different users, groups and roles associated with that. I can manage all of this into one particular subscription and then maybe the subscription will be part of my management group. So this is the full hierarchy which we want you to understand and using this only you can manage multiple users, multiple resources and the restricted access on each one of them. In this lecture, we want you to understand Azure Active Directory. Now if you have questions like what is Azure Active Directory and how it is different than a normal organizational Active Directory which you have seen in your organization. Obviously you are aware with this that in your organization also you are part of the domain and when you have joined this organization they have technically added you in that particular domain and that's the reason you got your username and password using which you can log in as an employee. If I focus on the official definition Microsoft says that Azure AD is your universal platform to manage and secure identities. Now identity itself is a big word and Microsoft has divided identities into four different sections which are known as four pillars of identity. 
These four pillars are authentication, authorization, administration and auditing. We'll focus on identity in depth later on. But right now, even Azure AD is not this simple with this one line definition. To understand Azure AD, you have to understand a couple of features and the services provided into Azure AD, as well as the different offers or I can say different versions of Azure AD which are available to us. As you can see in this diagram, Azure AD is not a one simple directory, but actually it is a Active Directory which is going to have group of users and roles associated with that using which you can connect your Azure Active Directory with literally anything. You can have number of applications which can connect with AD, maybe some other cloud based applications which are counted as a software as a service or maybe some other Active Directory which are part of your organization can connect with Azure Active Directory and you can globally manage all these users and identities of those users in one umbrella. That's the basic goal of Azure AD which we can achieve with different versions of Azure AD. If I go to Azure portal, you can see that in my subscription, I have my default directory which is configured with my name hotmail dot on microsoft.com and left side we have a section where I can click on users and I can get multiple users which are part of this AD. If I go back to groups, it's going to show me different groups which I can configure inside this. Or if I want to download the existing groups which are available in my any other existing AD, I can deal with that. The most important part which I want you to see right now is left side, we have two sections. We have first which is known as identity governance. And this identity governance is actually allowing me to control the rights access associated with different users. I can create and manage multiple security related things inside this. If I focus on another section which is Azure AD Connect, this is actually that tool which you can see you can download from this particular link. And this is that particular software which you can download and install in your server and then your server can synchronize with Azure AD. This is simply used by administrators when they want to synchronize their organizational server with Azure AD. And the moment you install this and configure this thing, your services like ADFS can also associate with Azure AD. And then your existing all the users of your organizational AD is going to associate with Azure AD. You can also associate your on-premise applications with Azure AD and you can get all the insights through monitoring with that. There are a couple of features which are not part of free Azure AD or I can say a basic Azure AD. As you can see on Microsoft, if I go to my Azure Active Directory pricing page, this pricing page is showing me that we have three different flavors of Azure AD which Microsoft is offering to us. The free version has a limited number of users as well as limited number of applications and features in that. You can go through this in detailed comparison of this thing later on or by yourself you can do this thing. But what I want you to focus is when we go for premium AD which is P1 and P2. When we go for that there are certain features which are only available in that. Like you can see left side, we have a features which are Azure AD join or we have a feature which is conditional access, multi-factor authentication. These are those features which are associated with this particular course. And if you want to use this thing with a practical hands-on, you have to have either premium P1 or P2. Feature and pricing wise, P1 and P2 are also different. And you can get the detailed comparison between these two in this particular link by yourself. In this course, when we are going to go for multi-factor authentication and other features, which requires premium AD, we will activate our premium version of Azure AD. But as of now, just understand that Azure AD is not like a normal Active Directory. It is actually combination or I can say a centralized controlling mechanism which is associated with 
your existing AD, your existing applications, which are maybe on Azure cloud or maybe on on-premise or some other cloud. And Azure AD is allowing you to connect with all these applications and users at one place. Multi-factor authentication is one of the widely used feature of Azure AD. And to use this thing, first thing you can notice, I have switched to my organizational AD. So I have switched to my organizational AD inside which I do not have the same users which were there in the previous AD. That was my default AD associated with my Azure subscription. And this is a separate Act2 directory which I have created later on. This AD is having only one user right now, which is the admin of my organization. And now, before I proceed to this one, I just want to enable multi-factor authentication for this particular account. And to do this thing, I'm first going to my AD and inside this left side, we have a security section. If we click on security, inside that, we will have an option for multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is also authentication, but it allows you to prove you are who you are by providing one additional level of authentication. It can be biometric where you are providing your fingerprint and your retina. It can be a SMS which is having an OTP or it can be a Microsoft authenticated app using which you are going to provide the number which is a security code shown in that. We can have different kind of configurations for multi-factor authentication and right now when I click on this, it's going to show me that you actually do not have multi-factor authentication associated with this. As we discussed earlier, to use this feature, I need to get a free premium trial. If I click on this thing, they are showing me that you can have this option by two of this. Either I can get Azure AD Premium P2 directly or I can use my enterprise mobility plus security E5 feature in which also I will get Azure AD premium P2. So either you take a P2 of AD which is a premium P2 version or you can take the full suit which is having all this thing inside that. I'm going to go for Azure AD premium P2 trial and I'm going to say activate. When we submit this request it's going to Validate this request and based on that it's going to show you that you have successfully activated your Azure AD premium. This is going to take some moments and after this if I go back to my security tab and if I click on this MFA, if the MFA activation is successfully done, this page is going to get changed. You wait for a few minutes and then you can refresh this full page and when you come back to the same section is going to show you a different screen. While this is happening, I want you to do one more thing. In a new tab, I want you to type aka.ms slash MFA setup. This will ask you to log in with the proper credentials of your account and there you can set up your multi-factor authentication configuration. It's saying that more information is required. I need to sign in with that. So I'm just going next that using this page I can specify which kind of authentication I want to allow and I want to configure for this particular user. Let's say I'm saying I want to do this thing through authentication through phone. I can choose the country. I can provide the phone number. And I can specify that send me a code by text message only. Now obviously these options are also based on the configuration which is done by a global administrator associated with this Active Directory. Whichever options they have allowed, I can choose only from those options. Now once I set this thing, I can click on next. It's going to go to step 2 where I have to verify the OTP which is sent to this. If I provide that, And if I verify, 
this will be that particular setting which I want you to do right now because there are chances that when I do this kind of configuration there are few people who are going to put some conditional policy access into Azure AD account and they are going to lock themselves. After that if you do not have a multi-factor authentication enabled then you're not able to unlock your account. So there are chances that you can lock yourself with this conditions and the rules which we are going to configure. So my phone number is already set. If I want to additionally set an authenticator app also, which is Microsoft Authenticator app, we can do that, but I do not want to do that thing right now. One authentication association with this is enough. I'm refreshing my browser page back to in, in that active directory. And now if I go to security, maybe that will be enabled. So we are going back to home going to Azure AD and inside that security and MFA. Now obviously after a few minutes this will be enabled for me and same for you also if you are doing this thing right now with me. Uh, meanwhile I am just going back to my AD and inside this AD I am going to my users. Once MFA is activated in your account you can go to this particular user account and you can see when you have list of users here you have an option for multi-factor authentication. If we click on this it's going to open a separate page where you are going to have list of users and I can have multiple users here for whom I can just check mark those users and I can enable multi-factor authentication for them. Now because in this AD I have only one user which is having multi-factor authentication disabled because I have not enabled that thing I'm quickly going to my another directory in which I have multiple users. So I'm going to click on switch directory and I'm going to my default directory again. So now inside this default directory if I click on users I have multiple users and if I go to same place which is multiple factor authentication this will end up on a new page where I have different users I can check mark a particular user who is part of this AD and I can enable multi-factor authentication for that user. Remember you cannot set multi-factor authentication for a guest user. The rule is multi-factor authentication can be applicable only on the domain users which are part of this AD or it is part of organizational AD and then synced into this Azure AD. Guest users are not having a rights to deal with multi-factor authentication. Coming back to this, if you want to use multi-factor authentication, the most important part is you have to go to security. Inside security, you have an option which is conditional access. When you go to conditional access, you'll be able to see number of policies which are associated with that. You can also create a new policy and you can configure that on which kind of conditions you want your users should access this. What I mean by that is asking your users to provide another way of authentication using multi-factor authentication is not a good habit if you are going to do this thing always. Because normally when somebody is asking for any OTP or an authenticator app, we all are human beings and most of the time if you make this thing very common, they will get the habit of providing OTP every time. And that is something which is not good for security reasons. That's why logically you have to create a conditional access policies which are going to help you to configure those conditions when you want to ask for multi-factor authentication. Normally when user is accessing from home or maybe from untrusted locations, we can add a locations into this and we can ask for multi-factor authentication or maybe a device of the user or the IP of the user is not secure that's why we are going to ask for multi-factor authentication. This kind of conditions needs to be configured by administrator to utilize multi-factor authentication properly. Exactly after this you will have a next lab which is associated in this course and you can understand how you can configure multi-factor authentication and conditional access for this particular user.
role based access control is that feature of Azure which is allowing you to control authorization on a particular resources. As we know, identity has four pillars authentication, authorization, administration, and auditing. Like we know, multi factor authentication is a piece of authentication pillar. Same way, role based access control is a piece of authorization. Like if I go inside my one of the resource group, we have a section which is access control. This is actually role based access control which is renamed into access control now. If you go through another cloud providers like AWS and GCP, then you'll get to know that, that this is something similar to IAM, Identity Access Management. This Identity Access Management simply means that it allows you to control based on the identity of the user that which kind of things he can access. This access control when you click is going to have four sections inside that. You can assign a role to a particular user on that particular resource. You can deny that assignment. You can figure out which kind of access that user is having and then you can see the assignments or you can assign the role from here also. And then we have a last and important section which is showing you available roles associated with that thing. Now you can check right now if I am inside my resource group and then if I click on this access control, I have list of available roles which are there. Again all these are built in roles and if I want I can create my own custom role inside that. Like you can see one of this role is right now custom role which I have created with my own customizations. And after this, when I want to apply this role to a particular user or group, we can do that thing. Also notice, here I have a long list of available roles. While in other case, the same access control I will get inside my each resource also. So if I go inside resource group, I have access control. And let's say if I click on particular resource, let's say if I go inside an application which is chat with Maruti. Now if I go inside this application, there also I have access control IAM. This option will be available in each resource and each resource group of your Azure subscription. And that's why role based access control will help you to control this thing at different levels. But the change is if I go inside this access control and if I click on roles, because I'm inside a particular resource, this is not going to show me all the available roles in that. It's only going to show me those roles which are applicable on this type of resource. So now this is your choice. If you want to do a role assignment on a particular resource level or you want to do this thing at the resource group level, you want to use a roles which are built in or you want to create your own custom role. Azure role based access control Azure and Azure Active Directory offers you two types of role based access controls. The left side one is your normal Azure role based access control which I have shown you just now, which you can access on Azure resources and resource groups. It supports for custom roles. As I can show you, we have a list of inbuilt roles and in which you can create a custom role also. If you want to know how you can create a custom role, Exactly after this video, we have a practice lab associated with this in which you can create a custom role using PowerShell. A scope can be specified at multiple levels, either at resource level or resource group level. And then you can associate to this thing with Azure CLI, PowerShell or your ARM templates or in REST API with this. In other case, when you go with Azure AD roles. Now we have already seen this thing inside Azure AD also we have roles and when you go inside that remember that is allowing you to access only Azure Active Directory objects. It means the object which are associated with AD which can be your organizational application, some other applications of Office 365 or some other SaaS. Also keep in mind it does not support a custom role. It means your Azure AD administrator roles will not allow you to create your own customized roles. You have to use only built-in one. And the scope of Azure AD roles, it set at tenant level, which obviously helps you to control your applications associated with Azure AD 
and also with the other tools like Microsoft Graph, Microsoft AD with PowerShell and you can access all those things within Azure portal. Microsoft Azure offers you network services and there are a variety of customizations which are possible with this network services. Now we know that somehow virtual network, load balancer, application gateway or CDN, whatever is mentioned in this particular screen, everything actually associated with some hardware. So somewhere we need an infrastructure or a hardware which is connected with all these things. Microsoft Azure is providing you to configure and manage all these hardware resources virtually through our Azure portal as well as you can handle this thing through PowerShell. When you're dealing with Azure Virtual Network or Load Balancer, you are actually able to configure this thing through private IPs and the public IP address spaces in that. And you can also use this thing to automatically scale your multiple virtual machines which are connected with your virtual networks. You'll have advantage of configuring all the security related things like firewalls and network security groups with inbound and outbound rules into this. In short, all in all, this service is providing you all the way of customization of virtual network and you can actually create and replicate something similar to your organizational network on cloud. So I am inside my Azure portal and let's see how we can create a virtual network in this. I'm going to click on create resource and when I do that, I have a section for networking. And you can see that we have application gateway virtual network front door which is one of the new service of Azure, firewalls, virtual van and there are a couple of options available in that. Let's click on virtual network. When I am seeing that I have to create a virtual network, this is a network associated with a particular resource group. So either I have to create a new resource group or I can choose the existing one. I am providing a name of the resource group. Giving a name of the virtual network, let's say Maruti first VNet, this is my first virtual network, so I'm giving this name with some unique number. It's asking me which location you want, which region you want, I'm okay with South India. And then I'm going to click on next, which is IP addresses. In this IP addresses, remember all these are private IP addresses. And that's why you have to take care of your classes of IP address space. Now I hope you're aware that we have something like class A, class B, class C kind of different different ranges available in IP. If you're not familiar with this thing, just use any search engine and just put a word IP address classes in that and you'll get to know everything about that. By default, they are giving me an option that we have one address space connected with this which is 10.000 slash 16. This 16 is something which is a IP address masking. And that actually controls how many number of IP addresses will be available in that particular range. And 10.000 is showing me that because it's starting with 10, this is the IP address which belongs to class A. Slash 16 is telling me that I am going to have total 65,536 addresses available in this as mentioned here. Now why this is 65,536? Because the logic behind this is something similar to this that whatever number you're giving after a slash, you have to subtract that thing from 32. Right now, 32 minus 16 is going to be 16. And then that number, we have to do 2 raised to 16. So we are going to get 65,536. Same way exactly below this, if you check, we are using a subnet. Subnet is a part of my virtual network. And by default, we'll have one subnet which is having a name default. And in that, they are specifying that we'll have an address space 10.000, which is same. But out of 65,536 addresses, we are going to give only slash 24. It means we are going to give only 256. Because again, the same logic if we apply here, 32 minus 24 is going to give me 8 and 2 raised to 8 is 56. Now this is the logic using this you can add multiple subnets into this because we still have couple of addresses available in this network and you can create one virtual network with multiple subnet. I'm not changing this right now and it's a rule that you should have at least one subnet so anyhow you cannot remove this. We are going to move forward to next one which is security. We have a section in which we have DDoS protection. I hope you are familiar with DDoS. 
which is denial of service and uh, Azure is actually having a basic protected integrated in Azure platform. So by default it is already associated in the basic one. If you want an advanced DDoS protection you can click on standard and then you can choose a DDoS protection plan if it is available in your resources. I'm not changing this right now and also we have a Azure firewall. We can enable firewall and we can set up a firewall on a particular IP address. And then you can control the inbound and outbound traffic to this particular network using this firewall. We are not configuring this firewall also right now, but these two topics you can just research for this particular certification. We'll move forward to next, next, review and create. And once we are done with this, it's going to show me that validation is passed. We are going to click on create. The deployment of virtual machine is successfully done. Let's click on go to resource. And you can see that I have a new virtual network created in this address space in the location which I have specified while creating this virtual network. We can configure DNS servers if we want. Uh, it's already provided into this, uh, but we're not changing it right now. If I check the address space associated with this, it's going to show me the same IP address space. And then if I click on subnets, I am going to have that, okay, by default we have one subnet which is default. And out of 256 IP addresses which are available, only 251 IP addresses will be available here because 5 will be blocked by Azure. Then left side we have a same section which is DDoS while creating virtual network if you have set basic and later on if you want to change it to standard you can do that. And then we have firewall which is not associated with this so it's not going to show me anything right now. Left side we have a section for security using which I can connect this thing with something called security center. Now we have a separate video to understand security center at that time I will show you that how security center is helping me to manage security of all the Azure resources at one centralized point. Uh, but we'll see this thing in a separate video so I'm not discussing anything about this right now. In this case I hope you are familiar with the virtual network and similar kind of you know networking services are provided by Azure. You can go through some more videos of mine on my YouTube channel to understand more about VPN gateways and load balancing and all those things. Thank you.
All right, so now it's the time to learn Azure Functions. Azure Functions are allowing you to write your piece of code as a function on cloud, which can run independently in a stateless environment. Azure Functions are actually part of serverless computing if you choose to run this thing as a consumption plan. To deal with Azure Function, we have two different flavors. A platform as a service, if you're choosing app service plan, which you already have, or if you're going with the function as a service, then you can choose this thing as a serverless in which Azure is going to allocate a computing whenever you're going to execute the Azure function. And this is something which is one of the cost effectiveness because you do not need to pay for any compute which is continuously allocated to that function. You only need to pay for the execution time whenever your function is actually executed. Azure functions are actually going to provide an open source web job core. Now, if you are familiar with web jobs and if you deal with web jobs in Azure app services, then let me tell you one thing. Azure functions are also associated with web jobs core only, but the only thing is this functions will be totally independent and it can be integrated with any existing Azure resources. It support for a wide variety of programming languages, including C sharp, Java, PHP, Python, JavaScript and all. If you are not a developer and if you are an administrator and if you want to write some piece of logical things in a PowerShell or Shell scripting, that is also allowed in Azure Functions. In short, if I have to explain this thing in one line, this is the cheapest way to execute your code on Microsoft Azure Cloud. Azure Functions can literally connect with almost everything on Azure. If you want to connect this thing with Azure Storages, with table blobs or queues, you can do that thing. If you want to connect this thing with any kind of event triggers like notification hub, event grid and event hubs, you can do that thing. Azure function works on triggers and that's the reason most of the time the piece of logic which you have written inside Azure function is going to get triggered by some existing event. It can be a new file which you have uploaded into your blob storage or maybe a new record which is inserted just now in Cosmos DB. You can associate Azure function with almost all the resources of Azure as well as there is an important section in which you can configure an alerts also which are based on Azure functions. So when an alert is getting triggered with that, that is going to execute the piece of logic which is written inside Azure function. There are a couple of things which I want you to keep in mind when we are dealing with Azure functions. Remember functions are based on triggers and that's why you can trigger them either from a blob, Cosmos DB, service bus, message queuing or maybe it's a timer trigger based schedule function where you can configure that every certain period of time is going to get executed again and again. You should keep in mind that you should avoid long running functions because when you go with the consumption plan, Microsoft is going to give you a 10 minutes timeout. It means if your function is running for 10 long minutes, at the time of 10 minutes timeout, it will get terminated. Same way if you are dealing with any HTTP request, and using the HTTP request, if you are doing request and response, then the timeout will be reduced to only 2.5 seconds. You have to remember that use queues for cross-function communication. We have a concept called durable function, which I will cover later on in this course. And if you're dealing with the function to function communication, durable functions are really easier one, or you can go with something called Azure logic app, which is also a part of a serverless computing. Always try to write a stateless function because this are going to be an idempotent and a stateless function or I can say a piece of code which is going to be helping you in your number of requirements. Lastly, I strongly recommend you to go through this GitHub repository where you will find number of samples on Azure function host. Once you are familiar with this basics, let's have a look at this Azure function app and Azure function inside that in action. Okay, so it's the time to create our first function app through Azure portal and uh, I'm going to click on create resource and, and we have function app here. I'm creating a new resource group and inside that we'll deploy this. The name of the function app, let's say I'm giving Maruti first func app one and uh, that's fine. We will we'll publish through code. Uh, runtime stack here has couple of options as we discussed in the previous video we have uh, different options available here we have dotnet core which means c sharp 
Node.js is for JavaScript, Python, Java and PowerShell is also there. Let's choose .NET Core so that we can get the C Sharp code in that. And uh, then in the version we are choosing 3.1. The region which is associated with this thing, let's choose uh, Central US only. We are okay with that and we'll click on next. The moment I click on next, you can see it's showing me that uh, to store the code, the, the piece of code which you're going to write inside your functions, uh, to store that code, you need to associate this thing with the storage account. You can choose your existing storage account if you have, or in my case, I'm creating new one. Which kind of operating system you want to use while hosting these functions, I am choosing Windows. And then here is that particular drop down, which is making sure that this one is going to be serverless. Now, if I choose consumption plan, it's going to cost me only when I execute my function. And this costing will be based on the time of that execution, which is already occupied by that particular code. Now, if I choose consumption, technically, I do not need to pay any amount until unless I execute that thing. And suppose if I go with app service plan, it's something like this, that if I have any existing app service plan, I can choose that thing. And in that case, because I'm already having an app service plan, technically function app will be free because it's not going to cost me anything extra even if I run functions inside that. If you want to go with the premium one and you want really high compute with this, you can go with the premium and you can choose a dedicated compute for your function app. But in my case, I'm choosing consumption so that it's going to be based on the execution. Do we need monitoring right now? No, we do not want to do monitoring right now. We'll move forward and we'll click on create. Remember the thing which we are creating right now is a function app and one function app can have multiple functions inside that. So number of functions will be more inside this. You can have as many number of functions you want to create in this, but all these functions will follow the same runtime stack, which is .NET Core 3.1. Okay, my function app is deployed. Let's click on go to resource. And inside this is going to show me that I have functions, proxies and slots. There are three kind of things are there. Inside the functions, I will surely not have any function right now. So the first thing which I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this plus icon. It's asking me how would you like to create a function? You want to use Visual Studio, you have to use Visual Studio Core or you want to go with the in portal editor. Now, if you do not want to use any of these tools, you can go with in portal. And literally you can write your code, taste your code, and you can see the logs associated with that within the portal itself. Not only that, Microsoft is also giving you a couple of ready-made templates available here. As we know that Azure function works with the triggers and every time the execution of the code will happen on the particular trigger. By default, right now we have two different templates, which is webhook plus API and timer. And if I click on more templates, we have more than 30 plus templates available within the portal itself. Let me click on webhook plus API and this will going to be like a normal rest based API where I can deal with the get post put delete operations with HTTP. I'm going to click on create. My function is created and you can see this is a function which is HTTP trigger one function inside this list of functions and it's having some basic C-sharp code inside this. As you can check, we have a libraries which are coming from .NET Core and also we have some libraries which are NuGet packages as well as system.NET, which is a .NET library. We can use .NET, .NET Core or any NuGet package which is based on C-sharp into this particular code. We have a very simple asynchronous task created inside this, which is having a name run. And every time when this function is getting triggered, it's going to execute this function and it's going to call this run method inside that. This run method is trying to get the values from my query string and the name of the parameter associated with that is name. And if I'm passing any name, it's simply going to print hello plus that name or if I'm not passing anything, then it's going to print please pass a name in the query string or in the request body. So this is a very basic hello world kind of sample which they have given us. The thing which I want you to understand is exactly below this section, we have logs and console or your function is getting called with the help of trigger. Then this logs are going to show you, then this log window is going to show you all the logs here. Same way. If I scroll at right side, we have a section which is for view files and taste. This view files is very much similar to your solution explorer of your visual studio where it's showing you all the files. 
You can add new files. You can have multiple C# -sharp files and the extension of the C# -sharp files will be CSX. Do not get confused with the extension because this is pure C# -sharp only. The configuration of function is done by function.json file. If you check on this left side, the function.json file is telling me that this is a function which is HTTP triggered and it can do get and post kind of operations in this. Also, if any other parameters are associated with this function, we can define this here. Every time when you change the template of the function or while creating a function from portal, if you choose a particular template, this function.json file configuration will get changed based on the template. Right now, let's see whether this function is running or not. Let's click on this URL which is get function URL. We have a full URL associated with that. Let me copy this URL. And in a separate tab of my browser, if I directly hit this URL, it's showing me please pass a name or a query string or a request body. Now I need to pass a name. Now if you notice this URL, it's already having one query string parameter which is code, which is nothing but a unique token for authentication. I am passing one more parameter in this using mPerson and I'm saying the name which I want to pass is mental stack which is the name of our website and if I hit enter it's going to show me hello mental stack. Now this is something which is telling me that just now when I have pasted this URL in the browser and if I'm hitting enter in that I am actually executing this function twice and logically I have to pay for only two executions right now. Immediately the moment your code is working and the function is getting triggered you can utilize this thing. Same way if I click on this plus I have plenty of templates available in this in which I have a normal Azure functions and as well as we have something called durable functions also. Like you can see I have a functions which are queue storage triggered, we have Azure blob storage triggered functions, we have Cosmos DB triggered functions. Now let's say right now I do not have any Cosmos DB in this account but uh, if I scroll up we have something called blob storage triggered. And we know that when we created this function app, it was creating one storage account also with this. So I know that there is a storage account which is associated with this function app. And let me configure a blob storage trigger function now. If I click on this, it's going to ask me that uh, what will be the name of that function and then which kind of path you're looking for. A name of the function by default is blob triggered one. I'm okay with that. And it is asking me that uh, which kind of path you are looking for. Now this path will be the name of the container with which you want to associate. Whatever name by default they have given I can change it but I am not changing it. I am just copying this name so that I can use it somewhere. And then the name of the connection string while creating and connection with the storage account it will be this one so I am okay with that. We will click on create and then it is going to create a new function now inside the same function app. So you can see one function app can have multiple functions. The first one was HTTP trigger and this one is a blob trigger one. It's just having one line inside this is having a run method inside which we have uh, parameters which are taking that blob and then printing the name of the blob with the size of the blob. And if I just move it right side you can see that this time also in the view files we have run.csx file and we have function.json file. But this time the configuration of this function.json file will be different because this is not an HTTP triggered we do not have something like get post and all. Instead of that we have a type of the function which is blob triggered and the path of that function which is sample hyphen work items that's the name of the container which it is looking for. This is showing me that if I change my function.json file then it's going to change the way the execution of this function is going to happen. To check whether this is working or not, I need to check one thing. I'm just going to click on integrate at the left side panel. And if I expand the documentation section, it's going to show me that the storage account which is connected with this function app is actually storage account train B031. Okay. So I want to go into the storage account and I want to do something with that. Uh, let me open a resource groups in the new tab. So I'm keeping my uh, one tab open in the browser which is actually having this function. Also let's do one thing. Up to this point we have not triggered this function anytime and I'm just keeping this logs open here. In the separate tab I'm going inside my resource group training RG and then inside that I'm just looking at this storage account which is storage account train B031. Inside that we have uh, storage explorers in which we can create containers, tables, file shares and all. I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to say I want to create a new blob container. 
let me give a name of the blob container which will be exactly same what I have copied from that sample hyphen work items. The access level for this let's say I'm giving container level access and then I'm going to click on create. Uh, if you're not familiar with storage account just uh, go through my Azure fundamental course otherwise uh, in the same course also after one module will focus on the storage accounts. If I expand I have a sample hyphen work items this is that container and my function is continuously looking for this particular container. Let me upload one file into this so I'm going to click on upload. We'll choose one of the files from our machine. I'm choosing one of the file and then I'm going to say override this file if it's already there and click on upload. The moment we upload this thing the size of the file is uh, around 2 MB and then the moment we upload this thing automatically this is a moment when my Azure function is going to get triggered because we have created function which is a blob trigger function. So the moment this is getting uploaded into this immediately I want to switch to my function app and I just want to wait here. Now you can see the moment I came to this function app it's showing me that okay you have uploaded one file which is with this name and the size of that file is actually this one. So this name and size which we are printing into this they are just triggering that function and they are printing this thing here. Now this is showing me that my Azure function can technically connect with almost anything on Azure and it has couple of triggers associated with that thing. I hope you understood this. Thank you. Okay, now it's a time to learn one of my favorite service provided by Azure and that is Azure Database Services. In Azure Database Services, we have so many flavors available. You can use the traditional SQL database with SQL Server on Azure as a database as a service or you can count it like a platform as a service also. If you want to create a virtual machine and inside that you want to install SQL Server, that's also possible and that will be counted as infrastructure as a service. So we have lots of flavors available in SQL Server. Suppose if you want to use a multi-model database offered by Microsoft which is known as Cosmos DB, you can go with that also. And you can deal with the different services which are useful in synchronization of multiple data copies or maybe the migration of databases to Azure. You can use varieties of service into this. In this video when I'm showing you Azure database services I am going to show you how we can provision a SQL server with SQL database and how we can associate and take advantage of geo replication available in that. If you are interested in something like Cosmos DB and all I request you to go through the videos which I have shared on our official site of mentalstack.com or you can go through our free videos available on our YouTube channels. There also we have a separate section for Azure Cosmos DB. As of now in this video let's focus on SQL database. I'm back to my Azure portal and we are going to click on create resource in which we are going to click on databases. As we discussed already we have lots of flavors available starting with the SQL Server, Cosmos DB, PostgreSQL or MariaDB. You can choose whichever you want. I am going to choose SQL database. It's asking me which resource group I want to choose. I can choose any one so I'm choosing one of them. Which database name I want to keep. I'm specifying Maruti SQL Server 123 or it's a database name so let's do Maruti SQL DB123. So this is my database actually so I'm adding a word DB with that. It's asking me which servers I want to choose. Now I have one existing server already in my account so I can choose that one but let's create a new one right now. Uh, it's asking me which would be the server name so I am saving Maruti SQL Server 123. That's the name of my server and I need to provide the admin credentials in which we are providing username and password which should follow certain rules so we are following that. Which location I have to choose for this let's say I am choosing East US only and I'm going to click on OK. It's going to show me that I'm, I'm creating one new database and a SQL server in this. Do you, I need an elastic pool right now? No I do not want that and I also want to change the size of my database to something smaller one so I'll click on basic and then I'll create a 2 GB database which is available here with 5 DTU. DTU stands for data transaction unit which is allowing me to control the number of queries executed in this. I'm moving forward 
and clicking on next. Do I need to access the SQL database somewhere from the public endpoints? Yes, of course I want to do that thing in the public endpoint. So I am specifying public endpoint uh, and I am going to allow my Azure services to access the server as well as if I want to connect this database to my computer, then I can connect through the client IP address also. So that's why I am specifying allow client IP address also with that. We'll move forward and we'll click on next, which is additional settings. It's asking me, do I need any existing database backup from somewhere? And if I want to get any database, I can do that. I am choosing sample right now. And in that, by default, they are giving me AdventureWorks LT, which is a sample database given by Microsoft. And it's going to have number of tables inside that with thousands of records. So I can really get use of that through multiple query generation and all. Let's move forward to next, which is review and create. And it's showing me that, okay, the estimated cost for me right now in this database is going to be 330 rupees per month. And that is also something which is estimated cost. So that's something which is a maximum Microsoft is going to charge me for this. If I run this database 24 by seven for one month. I'm going to click on create and that will take some time to create the SQL server and database with the sample database, which is adventure works in that. So let's wait for that. Okay. Deployment of our SQL server is done. Let's click on go to resource. In the overview tab, all the details that we have discussed is there. We have a pre-configured firewall, which is associated with the SQL server. So if I click on set server firewall, the first thing which I want you to notice is we have one particular public IP address added into this firewall setting. And this is because we have allowed the client IP address while creating SQL server with that. You can see the allow Azure services resources. That's also true in this because we set this condition while creating this. If you want to add series of IP addresses into this, or if you want to work on your office network and you want to allow that particular network, you can give the starting and ending IP range in this, and then you can save it. And then this firewall of SQL server will allow you to connect to this database. Left side, we have two important sections which I want you to focus. There is a section called query editor, which allows you to connect to this as uh, something like SQL Server Management Studio, but this is within this browser. So it's not that much capable, but it's still a good one. Let me log into this one with my credential. And if I do that thing, it is going to allow me to see all the table structures and store procedures provided in this particular database. So you can see because we have adventure worlds associated with this, we have a couple of tables in this. And then if I expand store procedures, I have that too. I can click on new query. I can put some queries here. And the moment I execute that thing, it's going to create alter table and it can deal with different operations associated with this. Second thing is left side, we have a section called geo replication. This is one of the important feature of SQL server associated with Azure. As we know that Azure is having global geographical presentation available everywhere. We have different data centers available in this particular world map. Depends upon your subscription, you will have different options available for replication. Now it's showing me that my primary server is on East US region right now. And if I want to configure in secondary server on any of these available regions, I can do that thing. I can click on one of the region and then it is going to show me a secondary region, but there is a catch in this. Let's say I want to connect the secondary region, which will be South India. The moment I click on this, you can see that it's showing me a page where I can choose a secondary region, but within few seconds, it is just removing that thing. And it's showing me this icon in which a cloud is actually crying. And it's crying because we are not able to connect to this region because it's not maybe properly paired with that. Now, let's say if I choose something which is Canada Central. Again, if I wait for a few seconds, if it is not pairable with this, it's going to show me that same logo. Otherwise, if it is there, you can notice that the secondary region is allowed, which is Canada Central now. The secondary type will be readable because this copy you can use only to read data just to remove the concurrency issues. I can configure an additional server or if I already have a server on that region, I can select that also. I am providing another server, which is Maruti SQL Server 456. That was one, two, three, this is 456. 
and then I'm providing a new credentials to this. Once I do this, I am going to click on select, it's creating a new server for me. Automatically, the pricing tier for this is going to be seen because it's going to be load balance between these two different servers because this is a secondary server connected with the primary one. The moment this is showing me initialize deployment, you can see that it is actually trying to connect with the secondary server. So it's not only creating a secondary server, it's also connecting with that. And if I wait for some moment, after some time, both of these regions are going to get connected with the solid line. So in spite of these dotted lines, I will get a solid line. And that simply means that my both the servers are ready and working in a sync mode. That is something which is advantage of geo replication available on SQL Server. I hope you understood this and you will wait for some time when you're doing this thing and you'll get a solid line in this.